What's up guys, this is Shane Farmer with Dark Horse Rowing. As you can tell, I have lost my voice a little bit due to uh, a regatta that we had this past weekend in which I was able to meet somebody that I've been a fan of for a long time. We've never actually connected until this weekend. Um, but this is Jack Carlson. Jack was the founder of Rowing Blazers, both a book and now an apparel line, and is also an amazing coxswain. And for those of you that don't know the sport of rowing, uh, coxswain would basically be the brains of the operation. They have the most challenging job in the sport, in my opinion. So I just wanted to bring him on board today because A, I'm a huge fan. Jack, so thanks Thank for you. jumping on a video with us. Likewise. And uh, and yeah, let's. I'll let you introduce yourself. So why don't, like give everybody a quick bio about you. I've been coxing for going on 20 years now, which is pretty crazy to think about. That's amazing. Um, I started in high school in Boston. Okay. Uh, coxed at Georgetown, yeah. then at Oxford and Oxford Brooks over in England, which was an amazing experience. Um, they do a lot of things very differently <laughs> over there. Uh, and then I was on the U.S. team for a few years. Okay. Now, mostly retired, yeah. mostly focusing on uh, on my business, Rowing Blazers. Yeah. Um, but still dabbling in coxing now and then. Okay. So, talk me through like the the bridging of the gap between your coxing experience and Rowing Blazers, the company. Right. Where where did those two cross and meet, and how did those two things happen? Yeah. So. As you know, I'm not sure how many uh, of your viewers would know of uh, Henley Royal Regatta. Yeah. I'm assuming most of you don't. Do you want to give them a quick rundown on that? Yeah, Henley is basically, um, it's like the Wimbledon of rowing. It's uh, a great way of putting it. Yeah, it's one of the most prestigious races, most prestigious events in the sport. Uh, it's very old school, very traditional. Um, and uh, it's, it's very, very elite. Um, I'd say outside of like the Olympic Games or World Championships, uh, Henley is probably one of the most important events uh, in our sport. Yeah. And it also has kept a lot of traditions around from an earlier time in the sport. So uh, for example, all the spectators, all the athletes, when you're not racing, you have to wear these traditional blazers that are, are often- very cool. By yeah, they're often very bright colors. They often have, um, uh, you know, some kind of embroidered badge on the pocket. And a lot of them have crazy traditions or stories about how you have to earn them or stories about the origin of the colors or the emblems that are on them. Yeah. And I first raced there in 2004. Okay. Uh, so a long time oh, ago. So this is when I was in high school. Okay. Yeah, when I was in high school. Uh, that was my first time racing there. Henley also, by the way, is a single elimination kind of bracket. So it's almost like March Madness. Yeah. It's, a, it's a series of two boat races, and if you lose, you're out. And if you win, you advance to the next round. And what's the distance? It's, uh, I think it's 2,112 meters. <laughs> I could be wrong about that, but it's a very odd distance because it's, uh, it's before the days of 2,000 meter racing. Right. Actually, the reason why we have 2,000 meter racing is yeah. because that's like the rounded, even version of Henley distance. So it was easier to set 2,000 meters than to figure out 2,100. And exactly, exactly. They rounded from there. That's yeah. why, like the Olympic distance, the World Championships, when people do standard yeah. uh, testing on the rowing machine, it's 2,000 meters. That comes from Henley, uh, Henley Royal Regatta, which, you know, goes yeah, yeah, back yeah. to 1839. That's incredible. Long before the rowing machine. Because I've definitely had that question. Right, people, why is 2,000 why meters two, the Yeah, distance? exactly. There's your answer. We didn't even come to this conversation thinking that was going to be a question we had. Well, there you go. <laughs> so when I was first racing there, I got knocked out in the first round. Very disappointing. Yeah. Um, but two things came of that. One, uh, I had a lot of time because I was knocked out on day one <laughs> to chat with uh, rowers from Australia and the Netherlands and South America and South Africa. And... Um, you know, to hear the stories behind their blazers. In the US, we don't have that, I don't know, that much of a tradition of the blazer in the yeah. sport of rowing. But in many of these other countries, they have a very rich tradition and they have all kinds of crazy and eccentric and weird stories behind their jackets and behind, you know, why this emblem or why these colors or crazy feats that you have to have accomplished to earn a certain blazer. Yeah. And I thought, wow, someone should 
write a book about this. And there was nothing out there. There was nothing out there. And, you know, I thought it could be even of interest beyond just the rowing community. That was part of the idea. Sure. So you guys, perhaps. So fast forward like six or seven years. I was a grad student at Oxford. Uh, I had been on the U.S. team a few times already. So I had uh, friends in the rowing world all over all over the world in New Zealand and you know Australia the Netherlands whatever yeah. and I thought man maybe I should be the guy to write this book <laughs> so that's how that adventure all started and so on the side while I was training and while I was studying when I could grab like a week here or a week there like after the world championships you know if I could grab two weeks I would go off and I would go to these countries go to these boat houses meet up with these rowers all of whom were either like friends or friends of friends yeah. Um, photograph them, record some of these stories, many of which had just been like orally passed down within yeah. the club. Like many of them had never been written down before. Um, so and were I, you doing all the photography, all the recording? Were you doing everything? I that? started out being like, oh, I'll just do everything. I very quickly realized like I should get professional yeah. photographers. So I ended up working with a few different fashion photographers okay. that made it a lot more legit. The whole thing really snowballed because yeah. originally I was like, oh, I'll sh you know, I'll get some of my friends from Oxford and Cambridge and from like the U.S. collegiate rowing scene. And then I very quickly was like, oh man, they have great traditions. They have really crazy blazer traditions in the Netherlands. Yeah. I got to go there. Favorite story? Man, Favorite there, there are a lot. I'm actually going next week to the Netherlands. This will be my first time going to the Varsity, which is, that's the big rowing event in the Netherlands. Okay. Um, and they have all kinds of great traditions around that right. uh, and around student rowing in Holland. Um, but just in general, that's my favorite set of traditions because one, they pass the blazers down from like rower to rower. So yeah. when a rower is retiring from the sport, he or she presents their blazer to a new rower who's just learning the sport. Um, wow. And so some of these blazers are like 80, 100 years old. And that's they're still amazing. being worn today. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is you're not allowed to wash the blazer um, unless you win the varsity. And the, the varsity, it's like the yeah. San Diego Crew Classic, yeah. which we were both just racing in, right. where it's you know multiple events, multiple boat classes, and so on. But in the varsity, the premier event is uh, it's a men's coxed four. Okay. Um, and. So if you're in that top Cox four for your club and you win that event, then you're allowed to wash your blazer. <laughs> Otherwise, like no one else can wash your blazer in the whole country. So some country. of these things go decades without being washed. Yeah, and some clubs are more dominant than others. Right. Some clubs haven't won in a long, long time. <laughs> so you have some of these blazers that haven't been washed in like 60 years, which is pretty that's amazing. Amazing. That's yeah. incredible. And uh, yeah, and the other thing that they do in the Netherlands as well is they fight using their blazers. So after a big regatta, yeah. like the varsity that I'm going to, they have, it's kind of like semi-organized fights where the rowers will grab each other by the lapels and yeah. they try to like wrestle each other to the ground or wrestle each other into the water. That's, um, that's and, amazing. And these are like antique <laughs> blazers too. So they're often like just getting ripped apart yeah. and you know, you'll have guys walking around with just like half a blazer because half of it's just been ripped <laughs> off Can and like it's in place? the bottom of the reservoir or whatever. Um, yeah, you're supposed to repair it yourself if you do it. So that's wow. the other thing too. You see a lot of the blazers are just like hand sewn by like these Dutch rowers who don't really know what they're doing. Yeah, it's that's hilarious. It's a, it's a whole... And, you know, all over the world, there are just great little stories and traditions. And that's, yeah. that's why I first was like, oh, wow, someone should, you know, look into this a little bit more. Yeah. So I did the book. The book came out a few years ago. And I also realized no one's really making these blazers properly anymore. Even a lot of rowing clubs that are, you know, like the most traditional rowing clubs. I realized a few years ago, like when I was working on the book or shortly after the book came out, a lot of people, a lot of clubs are having their blazers like made in China or they're like really? buying jackets at TJ Maxx and having like ribbons sewn on it. And there, there are a few suppliers that specialize right. 
in rowing blazers, but even they are like not really doing it sort of properly. Like if you look at vintage rowing blazers, the origins and some of the construction techniques that like make a rowing blazer a rowing blazer, they're yeah. not doing it. So, and they're certainly not doing it here in the US. Yeah. So I sort of thought, wow, well, I should sort of try to bring this back, you know? Yeah. So that led to, to me starting this company, Rowing Blazers, and we yeah. make all of our blazers here in the US. We make jackets for Leander Club, for the US team, for Cambridge, for wow. all kinds of American colleges and schools and rowing clubs. So that's kind of the story of that. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. That really did snowball. Yeah, it did. Yeah, 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 it did. I assume that's not where you intended on ending up with this thing. No, but it's fun. It's been a, it's been a wild adventure. And, uh, you know, it's great to still be, like, in touch with and involved in the sport, yeah. you know, in my, in my daily, like, work. Yeah. That's, that's kind of how I feel. Like, I, I, you know, Dark Horse works directly with the fitness community, yeah. not the rowing community. Right. And yet, it's my way of still being able to be involved in the sport of rowing. Yeah, it's um, awesome via the fitness community. So, okay, talk to me a little bit about your job in rowing as a coxswain, because because those of you watching, you know, we don't get into the sport of rowing very often. Like we talk about the movement of rowing, but not the sport of it. And we coach movement, not sport. Um, and yet, when I have these discussions about, if people ask what my role in the boat was, people ask where I sat, and in my opinion, yes, every, every seat in the boat, right? You've got eight rowers in, in the large boats. Every seat has its own personality. And you can define each of those personalities pretty, pretty comfortably. Yeah. But not a lot of people ask about the coxswain. And yet, in my opinion, and this is God's honest truth, I think that the coxswain is the hardest job in the boat. We're just, we just get to turn our brains off and we just do whatever we're told to do and we just try to be technically proficient. I'm not so sure it's the hardest, but... Well, well we're just the, the car, you're the driver. A little bit, yeah. Right? You have to execute the race plan, you have to understand the personalities in the boat, meaning you have to like understand the car drive. Totally. You have to make sure that everything is being executed properly, that you know where you are on the course, that you, I mean, it never yeah. ends. So, give us like the, the know, one minute rundown of what a coxswain's job is. From your opinion. Yeah, I mean, the coxswain is basically like the race car driver and the rowers are like the engine, yeah. basically. You know, uh, I'd say a coxswain's role can be defined as a few different things. Um, you know, I think the most important uh, is steering. That's something, you know, if you're on a rowing machine, that's not an issue, yeah. luckily. Yeah. Um, you know, it's communication, which is a pretty broad thing. Yeah. Um, but I'd say the most important part of that is, uh, is tactics and strategy. And that's where maybe there is some, some overlap with sort of the fitness community. I mean, there, there is a sense of tactics, there is a sense of strategy, a sense of how you're pacing, whether it's an ergometer piece or a race on the water that you're doing. The Cox pair at the World Championships one year, so that's only two rowers. Right. There you start to feel a little superfluous. <laughs> I'll say, but uh, you know, when there are eight people in the boat or four people in the boat, you know, you're the guy calling the tactics and calling the strategy um, and adapting whatever race plan you might have to the circumstances as they develop. Um, so that's really, really important. Of course, motivation is, uh, is a big factor as well. I think as you get to the more sort of elite level of the sport, that's, um, you know, I think that it should, in any case, be a little bit less right. uh, of the coxswain's job. Um, uh, and hopefully everybody's motivated themselves. <laughs> but, you know, I think tactics, strategy um, is, is really, really paramount. We have a lot of people, a lot of you that, guys that are watching, we have a lot that come from, they're looking for weight loss or they have a dusty rower sitting in their basement and they're trying to figure out how to get better at it so that it can be a training tool for them, right? And a lot of people come and we often, I often find myself wanting to talk about weight loss or lifestyle change or things like that. So where I'm going with this is how has what you've taken from rowing transferred into your everyday life? The things that you value from rowing and what has that done for you in, in your career and 
your relationships in, in the way that you live your life. Wow, that's that's heavy. Huh. I got to think about that for a second. Right. I got to think about that for a second. Take your time. Man. Something that's interesting, uh, or that's maybe a little bit different uh, about me as a coxswain is that you know when I was actually um, when I was actively coxing uh, on the team, you know I had to do a lot of work to be on weight myself actually, yeah. and I always I, I also just thought it was helpful for my job to do as much rowing and as much erging as I could as well. To connect with the rest of the group, also just to get a better and better and better understanding of, of the physics of it, of the psychology of it, whether you're doing a long erg piece or you're doing sprints or you're doing an erg test, um, you know, so all those things were kind, of, were kind of part of it. And, you know, it's funny, like I do often think uh, in my daily life, even if it's something that has nothing to do with physical exercise or work or like any kind of physical pain. Um, when I have like a, a long project that I'm working on or I'm like writing a report or a paper or something in it, I know it's just gonna suck and I'm gonna be sitting there just like doing it for a long time. I actually think back to like long ergs yeah. that I did and it's just like, you just have to keep, just keep taking one stroke after another. And like, you know, I, I, I literally, I think of that as a metaphor all the time. Like, you know, no, you can't like go get up and get a snack. It's like, that'll just make it, you know, you'll just like kind of feel lame. And like, yeah. it's just like, just sit here and just finish it and just get it done. Um, I spent an exorbitant amount of my time when I was uh, on the national team like just sitting on the erg, just plowing away meters really? and meters and meters and meters. Yeah. Well, one, like I had to, yeah. you know, I'm five, nine, most coxswains at the international level are like five, three yeah. or something. When, when I would go into the coxswain way in at the world championships, you know, I'd be like, I'm not a tall guy, but for a coxswain I am. I'd be yeah. like, man, this isn't fair, like, you like know? standing around a bunch of jockeys. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, I've been like starving myself and like working out like a madman, you know? for like months and months, these guys can eat whatever they want and do whatever they want, you know? Um, so that was one thing, it's like I had to, to actually like stay, because I had to be 120 pounds. Right. That's pretty crazy. That, to that's be, the cox and weight, by the way, is 120. Yeah, right? 120 at the international level, 125 yeah. for a US collegiate. Um, so, you know, like that's not easy to right. be like, you know, in your late 20s to be 5'9", to be 120 pounds, you know? So that was one thing. And the other thing was just to, yeah, to just get a better and better understanding of the physics and, and also of the psychology. And, you know, I'd say like, yeah, the big takeaways now just in work and in my daily life, it's like, you know, kind of discipline and, and persistence, you know? Um, you have to be very, very disciplined, uh, whether that's like during a workout. I mean, the erg, there's nothing like it. You have that screen just right Staring in your face. You, in the face, you know, stroke after stroke after stroke after stroke, you know, and really like in my head, I, I just like apply that metaphor to so many different, like it could be writing. It could be something that has totally nothing to do with it, right. but those hours and hours and hours of be, of sitting on a rowing machine yeah. and doing that it's like it actually helps it actually carries over like to get, all sorts of other things it, it's the grind that's yeah. exactly what it is that's exactly what it is um you know and then i think there is like there's a big discipline component to it you know Huge. and like i think that's a big that's a big piece of what a lot of a lot of you guys who follow i think that's a lot of what they figure out too is that <clears throat> This machine, like, I've never seen somebody sit on a rower and or an erg and do it properly without having been coached. Yeah, it's it's a learned behavior. It's not mm -hmm. a natural movement, which it's takes true. discipline to learn how and where to put your body in space and time. Totally, and that takes effort. Right? There's a discipline to learn a new skill. Totally, and I think the other thing too is that whether it's technically or physiologically, you know you just keep getting better and better and better. You're, you're never like, you've never like perfected it, yeah. you know? I think it was like, what was it, a week ago or two weeks ago, Josh Dunkley Smith set a new yeah. 2K record on the ERG. I mean, yeah. it's like, 
it's like any other sport. I mean, people are still setting records all all the time, and you see that, yeah, in terms of like a world record. You also see that with yourself all the time, and it's like you're gonna keep getting better and better and better. There's no like limit on it. Right. So and you never settle. You never settle. Yeah. You're, all, you're always striving for something better. Exactly. But exactly. Like there is no perfect stroke. Just like there is no finish line to life until the day you expire. Right? Exactly. It's all just, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. You at no point can you stay stagnant. No, exactly, exactly. So what would, what would your takeaway be for somebody who is brand new to this? They're look, they see the dusty rower sitting in the corner of their 24 hour fitness, nobody touches it, and they have no clue what this thing is about, but something has intrigued them enough to look up this video. And they're sitting and watching and they're like, why? Why like <laughs> what like what about this is intriguing enough that I should give it a shot? Well, for one, I don't think there's anything else like it. I mean, again, I'm coming from the perspective of someone who had a very strict uh, a very strict sort of like weight target that I had to be on yeah. consistently for a very long time. Um you know, and I did a lot of cycling, um, did a lot of running, yeah. uh, but there's just nothing like there's just nothing like the rowing machine. Yeah. Um, I also think, yeah, you just learn more about yourself on the rowing machine. There's something about that movement of taking taking one stroke after another, yeah. um, and getting that constant feedback. It's not. It's very different in many ways from running or cycling where I don't know it's not I don't know exactly how you'd even describe it but rowing and and being on the rowing machine it's like there's it's constant but it's also one thing after another right you know I don't know exactly how you'd you describe that like I think what you're getting is it's like a like making a decision millions Ex of times exactly that's exactly to, right that's exactly to, right to do something correctly or incorrectly or yeah, to that's punish a, yourself or to not punish yourself. That's a yourself. great way to put it. That's a great way to put it. And, you know, I was never great at, like, of course, like, my splits were not good, yeah. you know? I also couldn't eat a lot of the time that I was doing, which I don't advise <laughs> at a, all. That's not going to help you in your... No. <laughs> in your this was a special it. situation. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you learn a lot about yourself that way as well. I mean, there are all sorts of things I could say, like, that it's full body workout and da 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 da, da. But, buzzword, uh, buzzword, yeah. point. But I think like that to me is what's like the most interesting aspect of it. Exactly as you say, like you're making a decision millions of times in a, in a row, yeah. you know? Um, and I just, I can't think of anything else that's quite, that's quite like that, yeah. you know? And uh, you know, I did my fair share of rowing on the water as well. Um, I started as a as a single scholar when I was in high school. Yep. Uh, I I rode bow seat uh, for a couple of races uh, at Georgetown when I was a senior. I rode in in a freshman boat. Nice. Um, and uh, and rode for my college at at Oxford as well. So I've okay. I've seen it a little bit from both sides. Which is That's, pretty remarkable too. That's a huge advantage. I would, I'm sure that you would. Uh, it helps for coxing for sure. It's also why I say I'm not so sure the coxing is the most has the most difficult job in the boat but uh but yeah i mean i still to this day in things that have nothing to do with rowing nothing to do with exercise or working out th think of that experience i mean those many many hours that i've spent in my life on the erg yeah. and there's just something about that that a like on the one hand it's so applicable to so many things and on the other hand there's nothing else right. like it yeah right. okay so I'm gonna let you go because I know we're short on time and I don't want to take up your entire well, day. Thank you, you so much, going. man. Um, where can people find you? Where can people go to learn more about rowing blazers? You personally, where would you like to send people? Uh, yeah, you can uh, you can check out rowingblazers.com. Uh, you can follow Instagram at rowingblazers. You can follow my personal weird adventures. Sometimes have to do with rowing, sometimes totally not. Uh, at Jack Carlson. And I will tell you, check out rowing blazers, especially on Instagram. I'm a huge fan of the style component. Like I just watch your guys' stuff uh, thank and I'm like, 
I love I love what I get to see there. Like visually, it stimulates me every time I see. Thank it. you. That's so, so nice of you. I would encourage you guys to go check that out. Um, Jack, big fan of what you're doing as well. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, guys, as always, make sure you go to darkhorseroaring.com where you can check out our athlete programs as well as our courses for coaches to learn how to use the roar as a better training tool for your athletes. And we will see you on the other side.